Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, Dr. Yahya. As usual, you're too generous. Um, today, my, my uh, charge uh, this afternoon is to talk about the uh, Islamic brand name and Islamic banking. Um, this um, uh, pertains more to uh, so-called Islamic banking in, um, in the Middle East and Asia, uh, mainly because there is no Islamic banking, so to speak, in, in the United States uh, or the West. There is Islamic finance, but not Islamic banking. And uh, hopefully, I'll make... Uh, uh, Inshallah. Uh, just to remind you, for those of you who are here in the morning, uh, when we were talking about different faiths, um, uh, we're talking about religious brand names and why uh, some banks have to call themselves Islamic. Uh, again, I'd like to quote uh, Martin Luther. This is how I ended my morning talk. Uh, Martin Luther said, uh, a Christian cobbler does not make a Christian shoe, he makes a good shoe. And so an Islamic banker uh, would not be engaged in Islamic banking, he'd be engaged in good banking. Um, now, uh, I want to go uh, quickly over uh, what I think of as the current state of Islamic banking. And I would like to start on the liability side. I think Islamic banking started with completely on the wrong footing. It started on the basis of the idea of a two-tier mudaraba. That is, um, you, instead of depositing money with a bank and earning interest, the idea is you become an investor. You hold a profit-sharing investment account. And um, I think that's been a complete failure and eventually will lead to the failure of Islamic banking in the Middle East uh, or wherever they adopted this model. And the reason is that all the prudential regulations that um, Moody's monitors and that the Basel Accord that, uh, that um, Andrew spoke about and, and, and um, many of the auditing and accounting agencies adopt, um, are, are, all of those prudential regulations are put in place to protect depositors, debt holders, first claimants. Um, but the uh, profit sharing account holders in Islamic banks basically have it um, have absolutely no protection. They don't have the protection of being the first claimants on the bank's capital uh, because they're not debt holders. And at the same time, they do not have the same voice as shareholders uh, would in, if, uh, if they were in, in a corporation. Uh, they have no representation. So um, in a sense, it doesn't matter whether or not the bank is solvent because they're not first claimants. And um, at the same time, because they don't have control over the managerial policies, they do not have representatives uh, in the board of the Islamic Bank, uh, the alignment between their interests and the interests of, of the, uh, the uh, shareholders or the owners of the bank are, are uh, quite, quite lopsided. Um, and uh, if, if you actually read the literature quite carefully, um, there is an organization in Bahrain called Awofi, the Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institutions. And most of what comes out out there is talking quite explicitly about allowing leveraging and the fact that the profit sharing account holders uh, provide a cushion for the for the shareholders so they can leverage further and uh, and basically get higher returns without without enduring higher risk um, and that that is completely unequitable I think um, um, a combination of bad economics that suggested that Islamic finance would have to be based on Mudaraba together with uh, uh, careless jurists who, who, got, who got fooled into thinking that this is the way Islamic banking should, should be run resulted in uh, the catastrophes we heard about from, uh, from Dr. Yahya early on, uh, and I think there will be more, unfortunately, to come uh, because um, it's run by investors who, who basically um, use the risk, uh, the, the risk cushioning from shareholders uh, in order to, um, to get higher rates of return without, uh, without sharing um, uh, with them. Uh, in addition, uh, because the only thing, once you have that risk cushioning, the only fear that an Islamic banker has uh, is that the account holders, the profit sharing account holders will walk away and go to another bank. And so what they do is they create special internal accounts for smoothing the rates of returns that they pay those investors. Uh, so if they, if they earned uh, a high rate of return in any given year on their investments, they pay their account holders uh, still something that's close to the interest rate paid in the market and they keep the rest uh, in, a, in that special account so that in years when they have lower rates of return, they can, they can bump them up a little bit. In certain years, they even don't take dividends as owners in order to make sure that they pay competitive uh, interest rates. But the result of that is that in good times, the, uh, the uh, investment account holders don't get to share in the upside of the profits, but in really catastrophic cases, because they're neither debt holders nor, uh, so they're not first claimants, nor are they the ones who control the manager, uh, they basically get the short end of the stick. So they're exposed to more risk and get lower return. Um, 
Uh, in addition, uh, accounting agencies like Awofi uh, put in, in place rules that, um, that assets that are held by those Islamic banks have to be booked uh, on, on the face value that they acquired rather than being marked to market. And when you do that, basically you give an incentive to the managers to engage in what's called gains trading. That is, the good assets that are underpriced on your accounts are the ones you're going to sell in bad times. And the bad assets are the ones you're going to keep in bad times. That's exactly what you do not want to happen if you're uh, an investment account holder. Um, so that's all on the liability side. That's why Islamic banking was a bad idea the way, the way it, was, it was structured. Now on the assets side, it was clear that all it is is a secured loan by another name. So uh, we see that uh, uh, through the, uh, the efforts of, of uh, a number of, of um, Islamic banks or banks that, that operated in the U.S. for a short period of time, they managed to get the OCC to write letters about Murabaha and, uh, and Ijara, uh, basically saying, oh, all they are uh, are uh, secured loans. We know secured loans. Uh, banks engage in secured loans all the time. You can call them anything you want. Uh, we accept them. And so on the asset side, they were able to uh, mimic the conventional banks. Um, and at the same time, they can have that excess leveraging without giving control to the investment account holders or the protection of being debt holders and first claimants on the capital in case of default. Uh, then I want to uh, coin a term, if I may. Um, the way I think of, of Islamic banking uh, uh, working, in, especially in, in the Middle East nowadays, uh, for those of you who are not in this area, you may not know what arbitrage is. Arbitrage is what good people in finance do. Those are the people who make money no matter what happens. You basically find something that has two different prices, buy it where it's cheap and sell it where it's expensive. And all of finance is built on arbitrage pricing. That is that if such an opportunity exists, somebody will take care of it and will not exist much longer. Uh, and so prices have to be the same everywhere. Uh, I think Islamic banks engage in what's called Sharia arbitrage. Basically, you have a small uh, community-based Islamic finance institutions uh, that may not be as competitive as the big banks out there. And it's understandable why they're not as competitive. You don't have the developed secondary markets. You don't have the economies of scale. You don't have the trained uh, professionals. Um, so they notice that the cost to the consumer of the products of those Islamic banks, uh, this real Islamic banks, let's, let's call them that, uh, is a little bit higher than the conventional counterpart. So you say, we're going to engage in Sharia arbitrage. We are going to come in with our big bank. And we are going to capitalize on that difference in price. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to fool our Sharia uh, scholars. Um, they, they think that uh, the particular contract uh, that is the, the secured loan offered by, by a conventional bank is haram. That's fine. What we'll do is we'll structure something that does the exact same effect but has an Arabic name they can read in their 18th century books and get them to approve it and as a result be able to use a line of credit from our regular bank where if used for a regular mortgage maybe they can get uh, six and three quarters or seven percent and then use it to sell it to uh, compete with the Islamic institutions and maybe get a higher rate of return. We capitalize on that difference. That is Sharia arbitrage. Uh, my my uh, view about this is that there are many ways to sell your soul to the devil. The worst is to exploit the religious in the name of religion. So what I'm going to give you is my 10 rules of how to deal with Islamic banks. Um, uh, thank God, so far I've never accepted the penny from an Islamic bank. I hope to keep it that way. Um, and I've never dealt with one. But I can give my opinion. Um, and some things that people do I like, others I don't like. So I'll give you it's my top 10 list. The first, the first question you ask them is how much of their own money are they putting where their mouth is? Um, so, and, and compare that to how much of your wealth they're asking you to put into it. If they're saying, you should put half your wealth with me and I'm only putting 5%, then they're trying to leverage. They want to get a higher rate of return and have you carry the risk. If they're not putting your, their money where their mouth is, don't trust them. Second, beware of quote-unquote scholars with no credentials and much fun, fanfare. I'm not going to name names, uh, but you can see them. Just meet them at the airport, meet them at the supermarket, and then meet them at a conference or an Islamic bank. Uh, compare the way they dress, the way they talk. Uh, ask them where they do their banking. And ask them what credentials do they have? Why do they wear particular types of headdress? Um, do they wear it most of the time or only when they want to parade as scholars? Um, ask what regulatory agency oversees their operations. I think it was quite appropriate 
for the British um, authorities to say uh, to, to Al-Baraka, if you're not regulated in your own country, we don't trust you. Uh, and so the question I'd like to ask always is, tell me again why you're licensed in the Caymans? Uh, or the Bahamas, or somewhere offshore, uh, there's a reason. They do not want to be subject to the scrutiny and the protection for the consumers uh, that, that legitimate uh, banks are willing to, to deal with. And remember, those regulators, you pay for them. Your tax dollars pay for them to make sure that your interests are protected. Uh, so make sure you don't get to uh, deal with a company that bypasses that. Then, if you pass all those tests, you sit with them and say, what is it that you're doing differently? What are the advantages and disadvantages of what you're doing differently? First hint, there is no free lunch. If, if they tell you, oh, it's better along all the dimensions, that does not make sense. In my view, it's correct to do the marketing to market and make sure that the rate of return that you have is actually determined by market prices, for instance, a rental on, on, on an asset that's being financed. But there's a downside to that. Uh, if there are, if there are uh, price, uh, uh, price margins that are, that are not correctly reflecting uh, market forces because of bubbles, etc., you have to deal with it. There is no free lunch. Um, if you're doing a lease to purchase versus partnership, again, the question is, are, are, the, are the properties going to be appreciating or depreciating? So you have to understand all the advantages and disadvantages, and there's nothing that will be better along all dimensions. And if they start saying the only difference is some Arabic name that we call it Murabaha, and you can read that name in an 18th century book, then go back to 10 and start thinking about wh who are those scholars, what are their credentials, and so on. Um, so uh, they have to explain to you why the Sharia is telling them to do this and what is different. They have to be able to explain it to you in dollars and cents. Um, and then this is, this is the, uh, the, I call it the snake oil salesman uh, test. Uh, beware of bankers who all of a sudden, when the cash starts drying up in the market, appear with an extra slide that says Sharia compliance. Um, unfortunately, I saw many of them in the Middle East uh, last week. Uh, you can tell it's, it's the same sales pitch they've been offering all around uh, the world, and they didn't bother with the Middle East market because it wasn't that big. And all of a sudden, with the market crash, uh, they couldn't get VC funds anymore, so they figured they'd go there and say, oh, VC, that's Sharia compliant. Let's go and sell it to, to the Muslims. Um, that's always, if, if they've only appeared after the cash dried up and, and you can tell that the Sharia part of it is contrived, don't trust them. Um, and then, if they tell you that the difference is Sharia compliance, ask them what is the objective of the Sharia in, in, in this case. And then, once they explain it to you, if they can, ask them, would you abide by the restriction in any case, even if the Sharia hadn't told you that? Because once the Sharia, so you didn't know it ahead of time, then you saw that the Sharia uh, put this particular restriction. Now that you understand what the restriction is about, wouldn't you do it anyway? And once that's the case, uh, well, we'll get later to it. Um, and then be suspicious of bankers and consultants who are offering Sharia compliant products, and, and that's the word Sharia compliant, I hate that term. Um, um, it's, the, the, again, ask them what are the advantages and disadvantages and what are the intentions of the Sharia, uh, but just ask yourself, if, if all they say is Sharia compliant, uh, ask yourself if you would pay more at the vegetarian salad place just because pork is forbidden. Um, and then if, if, they, if they can explain to you what the Sharia says clearly, why they abide by it, why those restrictions are in the Sharia, ask them, then why do you have a Sharia board? Obviously, they serve no purpose if, we can, if, you can, if they can explain to you that this is the Sharia, this is the intention, and this is how we abide by it. Why do you need the board? Why do you need the legitimacy uh, with the names of, of the so-called Sharia scholars that they have? And then, if it's not so clear, ask them, well, are those scholars really that trained? Are they CPA certified? How do I know they know how to read a balance sheet? let alone determine whether you're hiding debt in a special purpose entity. I mean, we know people from Anderson couldn't see it. Um, how, how, can, how can we trust somebody just because he was trained in jurisprudence, if that, that they know how to determine whether or not there is illicit debt on your books? And then, if they ask them if they're advertising their products only to Muslims or to non-Muslims as well. Um, and if not, ask them why not? Why aren't they selling it to non-Muslims? If they really think it's a better product, why aren't they marketing to everybody? And again, as a hint, ask yourself, would you go and eat at the restaurant only because this meat is halal? Don't you also want to know that it's good? 
And then if you're satisfied with 10 through 2, ask them, then why do you have to call it Islamic? Why isn't it just a good shoe? Thank you.